Welcome back to the final special narrated episode of Hand Tool Rescue. I had a good response on the narration, but it unfortunately will be going away, and things will be back to normal very soon. So let's get started. I am working on the wooden portion of the frame of the drag saw. It is going to be completely remade, left rough as to look old, uh, but completely new out of elm. It is something that I have locally here. I actually milled this piece of wood myself uh, and dried it myself, and I finally have a chance to use it. It will be much heavier, much stronger than the original pine or fir or spruce that was used, some sort of softwood, so it might add some weight, but it'll definitely keep things a lot more rigid over time. I like to personally try and destroy all my tools to the maximum so that I have to buy new ones. It's really a great idea. I'm going to leave this rough, but not crazy rough. So you can see my cut line there is not the greatest, so I'm just going to use the power planer to clean that up a bit uh, so it's nice and flat. One of these edges needs to be nice and flat for the surface of the engine to actually sit on. I'm using oddly a flushing or skinny knife to uh, form the handles on the wooden frame. I'm going to do my own design on the handles. Why not? Uh, there seems to be an inconsistency on, on what the handles really look like, so I get to kind of do whatever I want to do here. Again, leaving it kind of like that hand-hewn saw marks look on it, almost exactly like the original that I have right here. I'm lining up the holes, the initial holes for the bottom uh, of the wheelbase that I'm going to be attaching later, but I'm going to add an inch or two of material to overhang on the edge just to add a little bit more stability to the whole saw. I've seen uh, these things running and sometimes they rock back and forth like crazy uh, and makes it, you know, even more dangerous than it already is. I have new black square head bolts, uh, but original nuts that will be going on here because, as you saw in the last video, I completely destroyed one of the bolts trying to get the nuts off. The wheels are just solid steel through and through. Very, very simple. Uh, they are spoked. We fixed one of the spokes in the previous video, uh, and they just ride on these axles that are also cast iron. So it's just a cast iron to cast iron surface, a little bit of oil, and that's pretty much all you have, apparently. You can see that overhang there on the, on the base. I'm hoping that that does help. Now I'm missing the pins. These are the original pins, I only have one, and that locks the position of the wheels in place which can be tilted, and you'll see near the end of the video how that works. So I'm just going to quickly remake the pins on the lathe. Very, very simple turning. Uh, it's just two diameters in a certain length, and you're done. I attached it to a bronze chain that I had uh, in the shop, and that'll look kind of nice, I guess. Nicer than a non-bronze one. I need to also form the what I'm going to call the kind of hook or latch bolts uh, that are used for mounting the engine in, in the back to the actual metal frame that we just attached to those wooden pieces. So the original ones are completely bent, the threads are destroyed, so they need to be completely remade and it's incredibly simple to turn something straight into a hook. So I will do that twice, of course and try to match up that angle of hook to the original, and I got pretty close there. And as long as it can hook onto that metal frame, uh, we'll add some rigidity to this whole thing. You can see how that hooks underneath right there. All of these bolts were upgraded uh, in size. They went from 7 16 to half an inch. I thought an extra 16 of an inch of material would also increase the rigidity of this entire 
tool. It's just, I don't want to see this rocking back and forth when I'm running. It's dangerous enough as it is. So now the back of the engine is situated precisely as I want. So I will mark the front positions and just drill the holes and everything will hopefully be fine. Again, this is just an upgraded size. The holes in the actual casting of the engine block are large enough to accept this. Maybe they were left undersized so you could kind of move the engine a little bit left and right to position it accordingly. But in this case, I get to align everything completely perfectly because uh, I am the one reconstructing this. I also opted to go for a little accent of brass nuts just for the engine block. No real reason, just thought it would look good. Now the gas tank we didn't tackle in the first part, but we need to get to this now. I need to remove all the gross gunk and paint off of it, which isn't original. Originally this was galvanized. But I do need to find out if there's rust inside, if any of uh, the holes are blocked in the, at least the kind of gas filters or whatever is going on in there that allows gas to come out of the tank. Uh, and a check for leaks, of course. So there's something flying around in there and I can hear it. So I'm going to fill this entire thing up with evaporust beyond the rim to see if it does leak. And it seems to leak right at this crazy soldering business going on here. I'm not exactly sure what happened here. My guess is that someone tried to solder on a new threaded cap and ended up chasing the solder around the entire cap and the rest of the tank. And that worries me. Maybe the solder around the cap melts at the same temperature as the rest of the solder in the entire tank. So gas will start flowing out everywhere. So just to make sure I don't fall into that same trap, I'm going to seal it with a, a gas resistant epoxy. And if that fails, you can actually buy these gas tanks completely brand new. Uh, there are people that make them and I can just do that if I need to. Here we have the mixer slash carburetor as some people might call it, but this isn't really a, a carburetor in that sense. Everything has been completely cleaned. You can actually buy the valve stems um, or, the, or the needle valve stem portions completely brand new uh, as well. So if these don't seat well and when I close the needle valve, it completely shuts off the gas. If a little bit of gas gets through, then I can buy uh, a new needle valve and I don't have to worry about that. So. Little things like that in terms of having those options is really nice. Rarely do I get to have that with, with the tools I'm restoring. It puts my mind at ease. Especially this one. This one is the side that you would use to heat up uh, the engine and run it on gas before you switch it over to kerosene. And I won't even be using that portion at all because we're running it straight off gasoline. I purchased a gasket in trying to find the best possible gasket or at least the closest to what was originally there because this gasket uh, that I took off in part one is not original either. But the one I did purchase is a graphite and stainless steel gasket. I would assume that probably just copper, like a solid chunk of copper was the gasket for this originally. Uh, it might have been something different, but just because both surfaces are, are already pitted, I'll just put some gasket uh, silicone all over this and it should seat just fine. Now, if you are paying attention, you'll notice a large mistake I just made there. Some people might have caught it, some people might not, but I completely forgot to cut the hole for the piston in the gasket before I put it on. I'm a genius. So luckily I didn't torque anything down and tighten all the bolts. So I just removed it quickly, cut it out, uh, and then slapped it back together before the silicone had time to dry. You have about an hour or two before uh, that dries and you really need to crank things down anyways. But 
that would have been horrendous if I totally forgot and didn't catch that mistake. Just leaving these hand tight, and then in about an hour or two, you go and you super crank. Tighten them to the torque specs, which don't exist for this, so it's just going to be as tight as the recommended torque settings are for that size of thread. Now, the valve springs I can actually just put on by hand, which is odd. They're weak enough that that's the case, but they don't need to be any stronger, apparently. Now, the rocker arm pin was completely worn out, so I just turned a quick new one. Nothing very confusing or special about that. And I'm just loosely putting in the cotter pins that I will then cut off and bend out when I'm sure everything is correct. The rocker arms are fine enough. You have to remember that everything on this motor is uh, kind of made to be sloppy. The governor assembly was kept together, if you remember from the first video, because I didn't want to mess with some of the settings, and that actually worked out massively in my favor, and it was a great call by me by just pure chance uh, when I tried to get this thing running. It was uh, difficult, and, and I'm glad I didn't touch any of this. I know how it works now, so that makes me happy, but I just... Uh, I'm also very happy I didn't mess too much with that. If you haven't noticed, I am not painting this. This entire engine block will not be painted. Um, the exposed brazing is going to be there. I want to show that off. I want to keep this thing looking somewhat old, but I need to fix everything that is wrong with it. I need to get it running. The reason I'm keeping it old looking is that... I want to show this off at engine shows locally, and uh, I think that that kind of matches what it needs to be for that type of event. Uh, and if I ever want to paint this, I can I can paint this. I know everything's that's wrong or okay with it, and I'm not concerned. I think it will be a good look over time to have this thing not uh, literally sprayed green or red, depending on what year. Uh, everything, everything was spray green or red, just oversprayed everything. I don't personally think it looks as exciting. I did, though, decide to paint certain parts to highlight certain motions or assemblies of motion, if you want to call it. Uh, so here I am coloring everything green, the original color green. Uh, of the actual moving saw arm and the flywheel itself will be completely red. It just kind of draws your eye to those two aspects of the motor, which I think are, are the cooler of all the aspects of the motor. I'm also reinstalling the original shims. They were stacked four shims high and I'm removing one. Uh, remember, I didn't touch these uh, Babbitt bearings at all. So I'm just going to remove one shim. That should tighten things up a bit uh, and bring forth a, a new surface for the uh, nice cleaned crankshaft to ride on. As long as it moves freely and doesn't have any play, uh, I'm completely happy with that. Getting the connecting rod on is uh, kind of tricky. And I'm just kind of oiling as I go along, some of these parts will eventually receive grease, but the little oil just to get things going is, is fine with me. I do need to still attach the counterweights to the crankshaft, and that is there because this design of a motor does not have a flywheel on the other side. It's a saw arm on the other side. So to balance that weight, you need those counterweights on the actual crankshaft. Otherwise this thing will be jumping around uh, up and down. It would not be balanced at all. So these are the counterweights. I thought a little bit about highlighting these as well in some sort of paint color, uh, but I decided to just leave it. All the kind of mechanical engine parts are just gonna be left because at the end of the day, this thing just spits out oil. The cylinder is completely open. Uh, it spits out oil and gas, and those turn basically black anyway, so what's the point? 
hitting that with scotch bright was so interesting even the camera fell asleep finally on to the clutch mechanism this piece i didn't even know what i did wrong until i went to go start uh, this entire saw this was tricky very tricky first off the first problem the bronze bearings where the balls are uh, and the top steel cap they touch the ball but the balls don't actually touch the they can't move so now that there's a gap the steel disc is actually riding on the balls instead of just on the bronze itself that must have worn significantly over time uh, and now i've switched to grease because i know there's a, a grease cap on this Now the main clutch system is kind of like a cone um, where there's an inner portion. You can kind of see it there with the see-through holes and then the outer casting. And those are supposed to be separate pieces. I don't know why I didn't catch that, but they're completely stuck still. Even after uh, being evaporous that they're so close together, not even water can get in there. So uh, once I turn this on, it finally freed up that clutch and uh, like turned it just by hand it freed up that clutch and i was able to see all that rust come out luckily i sorted that out before i got things going also the outer ring piece the piece that the washer just touched that bushing should have been on the inside of this clutch that's another issue uh, that i didn't catch until i went to try and turn this thing over it's little things like this that <laughs> Actually filming the process kind of helps. This is the shaft that the entire saw arm mechanism turns on. And I actually ended up completely remaking this uh, thick shaft. It was, it was too worn when I would spin the flywheel. It just, the saw arm was not safe looking at all. So I turned it brand new out of stainless steel and, it, and it's uh, much better now. You can see the saw arm go together here, the big gearing, uh, which is probably fine with just some oil, uh, maybe grease, but it, it's not a big deal. Usually it's a smart idea to put the key in before <laughs> before you assemble things, but uh, luckily things are so loose here, it doesn't even matter. With that assembled, we're back to finishing the frame. I'm trying to attach the uh, spikes near the front of the frame of the saw that latch on to the log, dig in, and help uh, stabilize this entire tool even further. So I just use some red paint to mark the spots where uh, the little feet go so these these spikes can't twist in position and then I'm just going to lock it down with brand new square nuts because uh, the original ones remember we had to chop off with the angle grinder and no more carriage bolts for that specific application because they're the work of the devil. The uh, chain and hook there's a brand new chain everything else is original other than these screws here that I'm using and I'm just gonna cut off any excess that gets in the way of the, the chain mechanism from actually functioning. So with a heavier duty chain, the original one was somewhat light duty, I would say. I don't know if that was original. It was a weird two piece chain link, like someone just found it and pieced it together. So we're back to normal on that. This is the arm that the saw arm carrier rests on when it's not cutting wood. Uh, there's a little slop in there, I guess, to allow you to adjust for any movement of wood or something like that. But this really locks that frame into position, and I'm, I'm happy it's there. Now we're on to making uh, the connecting piece for the saw arm that kind of mimics human beings sawing. 
I get to use my nice Stanley number two hand plane for this. Whenever I can without a hand plane, I'm going to because I absolutely love it. And I'm just trying to match the original, which you can see underneath here, as close as possible. All shafts, all big shafts on this are an inch and 16 in diameter. So that's what I have here with this Forstner bit. Uh, but it's not just about drilling two holes for the shafts. There are also these locking bolts at the end to stop the ends from splitting. So both ends need to be drilled like that. They need to be uh, threaded and locked in place. I'm not sure how original these are, uh, but oh, I have to replicate that because I really kind of think it's a good idea. This piece right here is also elm. All of the wood that I'm going to be using is, is elm. It's what I have. I need to finally drill and countersink the oil holes. So originally I read that this was oil-soaked ash. Um, and ash is kind of somewhat similar in properties to elm. Uh, probably a better suited material than elm for this, but it'll be completely fine. Here, I noticed that this looked like it was wrought iron, and it is, so I'm brushing on hydrochloric acid onto this piece of steel, and it will etch the surface of the wrought iron and give uh, the grain a nice pop. And that's for the arm uh, that also attaches to the saw arm. By arm, I mean the actual handle that a human holds onto and doesn't die from sawing. The gas tank is finally attached. I did put the little um, wooden runners underneath the gas tank to support its weight uh, afterwards. Not a massive deal in, in my opinion. But these new arms right here, I know everything is an arm, but it's all really army. It's a very army tool. Uh, these were turned new by me. Uh, and they're sufficient for what needs to go on here with this mechanism. The new bronze bushings that we installed in part one are working completely fine. They're not too tight. I was worried they would bind because to get that kind of perfect line bore on these is, uh, is kind of difficult. So I I'm glad it's running pretty smooth. The piece of wood I just attached is also elm, once again, and that's where the saw sits in and guides. So that, without that piece, the saw would literally just flail left and right as it tried to cut. Uh, so that's really all that holds the saw from uh, killing you in your sleep. That's that handle that we just etched with uh, wrought iron and uh, hydrochloric acid. I think wrought iron's gorgeous, so I like to pop that grain. It almost has like a wood grain appearance. There's the wooden part that we just spent time finishing. I'm kind of tempted to soak this in oil. I don't know if that would change any structural integrity or anything like that, but if I keep the shaft oiled through the oil holes, I, I, I'm confident that's sufficient for the amount of use this thing's gonna get. Finally, we're attaching the clutch arm. So you can engage the clutch when you're holding on to the handle. And cranking the muffler downwards this time and not directly in my face. I'm giving everything a coat of boiled linseed oil uh, just to protect it from rust and to kind of stop Stop any dirt kind of getting in places that it doesn't need to. Ever have this feeling that a bunch of people are watching you? I hand filed every single tooth on this until they were nice and shiny. It's dangerously sharp. I cut myself uh, just looking at it. The saw attaches with only two bolts. That is all. There's a lot of weight on those two bolts. So uh, it seems to have other mounting positions for something else. I'm not really sure what that is. And finally, we're onto the magneto. We took this off almost first 
in the uh, part one, and it didn't have any spark. So we need to investigate as to why that is the case. I'm not exactly sure at this moment, uh, but usually with a magneto, it's the points. So we're going to investigate the points and probably clean those up. Now, when I took the covers off, I noticed some writing, there's north and south written, and then I noticed this red and black wire are new. They're not covered in cloth. They're not original 1920s or 30s wires. They're new wires. So someone has been in here doing something at some point recently. So that kind of gave me some hope that it was just maybe the points were a little bit dirty and then once we clean those up it'll be fine let's just hope that's the case i'm kind of happy that someone was in here that means that it may have been rewound or remagnetized or just had broken wires that were grounding it out replaced i don't know but i'm glad to see someone was in there touching something but i'd like to see it work more than anything we need to remove this blasphemous black paint over brass. Uh, not original, and it comes off incredibly easily. Another sign that it was not original. And I'm just going to take 900 hours here to hand buff almost with uh, steel wool. The outside of all of these. And then uh, give a little accent of red on the stop button. Uh, just because I thought it would be nice, and then I'll wipe the the paint off and reveal the lettering underneath. The spark plug you can actually service and take apart. So I've done that. I should have replaced the copper washer, but that's not the end of the world here. I just want to see this thing work. Uh, and you have to tighten it, not too tight that you crack the porcelain top, and that's it. We'll regap it, and it should be back in service. Now this tag is obviously worn because that's what it's supposed to look like. There's literally nothing left but the numbering that was stamped into it um, by hand or by machine. So that is crazy, crazy. Luckily, this is another thing that is currently made that I can just purchase. So all I need to do is buy one and stamp it myself with the obviously the exact same number. Uh, and then I'm done. Very, very happy with that. It even comes with the two little rivets that you need uh, to attach it to the, the brass frame. I also bought a new one of these. The one on the right is deteriorating. Hey, if they make it, why not just pick one up? Makes my life incredibly easy. These rivets are kind of, uh, not pop rivets, but ones that you have to spread the bottom out of and I'm using a uh, tapered punch on the bottom end and a hammer on the top to spread that out and lock this in place. And we're done. We're in the zone. We're so close. Now I'm cleaning up the points, uh, or the one point on this side and just the general outside of that. And now it meets well. It seems to magnetize sensually, and that's all I really need to attach it to the actual engine block. You can see the stop lettering there on the button. I also machined a new piece, uh, or a pin I should say, for the magneto. This is what latches on to the, uh, the timing rocker that decides when this thing is going to spark or not. And I'll give it a little shot of oil. The original one was just a bolt with threads. So that's not okay. And we have spark. So we're in the zone here. There's nothing else many missing. Uh, we have fuel, we have spark, and we have an unnecessary amount of compression. Turning this over by hand is incredibly more difficult than it was when we started. So I'm happy to see that. It's just destroying my body. Brand new old oiler set at the proper oil, which is about 15 to 20 drops per minute. This thing is thirsty. The gas primer cup, 
uh, is all the actual stem is all bent so I turned a new one out of brass and spun it on now it's more of a thumb screw and I like it I think it looks good maybe you do too and finally I almost was going to fill this up with water without putting the uh, valve on and this we use to drain the water after use and yes I did say water so we need to fill this up with water it's not an air-cooled engine we also need to fill all grease cups with Nutella. Uh, it is the best grease possible for this application, obviously. The hazelnut notes just add a je ne sais quoi to it. I also, on my way from that table to here, decided, hey, I want to do fancy grease cups more more brass accents everywhere because you can never really have enough brass accents so I decided that this one's gonna be brass and the one on the connecting rod is also going to be brass accept it the final touches are painting the lettering on this portion of the saw arm and cleaning up the red flywheel with all that overspray paint uh, in areas I don't want. Uh, so that has been cleaned up. Then we're gonna cut these cotter pins to size because I bought only super extra long ones because I hate myself. And uh, we're pretty much ready to go after that. I started filling out this water, and then I thought, hey, why don't I just fill it up with evaporust? So I did, and it'll de-rust as we go along, so uh, why not? You just can't leave it in there. Uh, you'll start etching that, because it's not fully submerged. Now, we locked the log using the chain to the saw. We moved the pin. We move one wheel sideways, because if I move the other one, I can't turn the thing over. We mess with the timing here. There's three settings. There's also speed settings on the actual governor, and we give it a go. The settings on the timing are stop, start, run, and fast, and the governor ones are just slow to fast. I suck gas in by putting my hand over the mixer, and that draws gas or more gas into the cylinder, and I just kind of turn it over and hope I'm not flooding it at this point. It looks like it's about to go, but you never know. Oh. So now that it's actually running, uh, I am fiddling here and there, adjusting the speed using the actual governor as you saw just there. I'm advancing the timing or slowing down the timing. I'm touching the throttle rod. I'm increasing or decreasing the needle valve on the gas mixer to allow more or less gas in. It's all kind of a balance here to get it to sound and run consistently nicely. And I finally believe I get it to run on a nice slow setting and then I can ramp up the speed with the governor more and more and now it's running at maximum craziness. It's already unnecessarily dangerous. There's way too many exposed moving parts. Uh, not to mention a box that all it does is make sparks and shock you right beside the flywheel so that's nice. I'm kind of trying to get it to as low a speed as I can possibly get it to. I don't need to be sawing a log at Mach 1. I was at this point where I thought, oh my god, I broke something, something's happening. Why is it dying slowly? And uh, really, I just ran out of gas. So put some new gas in it, got the saw position, engaged the clutch, and started sawing. This thing is an absolute nightmare. When you hold this thing, you've never been so scared in your entire life. It's just crazy. After 
10 seconds, I'm out. I'm out. I'm gonna die. The, the actual saw frame is creeping over to the left closer to me and off of the log. And I really don't, I don't need this entire thing to fall off. So I, I just need to stop. If this was a real tree where the log wouldn't move, this would be a much safer uh, situation. I have some nice slow motion shots here to kind of show you the mechanisms at work here. And they're all incredibly interesting. I absolutely love this thing. Especially the arm, how it moves back and forth. It's sliding so nicely, nice and greased up. Uh, consistent motions. It's not losing power. And it cuts super quickly. Like, that is very sharp. I would love to test this out on a really large, large lock that can't move. Like a fresh, fresh with that lock. You hold the stop button and pray that it stops. And you have to hold it the entire time. If you let go and it's still turning, it's going to just start up again. It got hot enough to where the, the water almost started boiling. So uh, that kind of gives you a, a sense of how much heat this creates. And that's it. It is done. I will be using this as a showpiece and a remembrance of all the patrons that helped me get that tool and restored. I really, really appreciate all that kind of stuff.